Hello. As a former history teacher, I know that Canada in the mid-20th century had a quantitative easing model that worked to the benefit of both our business community and the general public. Yet, in addressing our COVID-19 crisis, government has chosen to ignore that model and implement one that, in my opinion, both empowers and enriches the finance sector to the neglect of the real economy. So this video is about that choice. So quantitative easing is the injection of money into the economy by central banks. Where do these central banks get the money to inject into the economy? Well, they create it out of thin air. And if you think that's irresponsible, you may want to consider that that's exactly what private banks do. If you go into a bank and ask for a mortgage for, say, $300,000, the bank doesn't loan you its own money. It creates the money digitally. So when central banks create money out of thin air, they're simply doing what private banks do every day. In Canada, this use of quantitative easing started in the 1930s. The Bank of Canada was created as our central bank in 1935, and then in 1938 it was nationalized. And right from the very beginning, the Bank of Canada began creating money out of nothing and then loaning that money directly to government. And those loans took the form of the Bank of Canada buying government bonds and treasury bills. So government bonds and treasury bills are the ways that governments traditionally borrow money. They issue bonds, it could be for long term as much as, as 10, 20, 30 years, and treasury bills for a much, much shorter period. They sell them to financial players, mostly banks, and they guarantee you to pay interest on these loans that essentially the banks are giving to government. When the decision was made by the Canadian government to start selling treasury bills to the Bank of Canada, what the government was essentially doing was now borrowing money from itself and paying itself interest. So what does it do with this money that it borrowed from itself? Well, it used it to finance the war effort. After the war, it was infrastructure projects. Think of the Trans-Canada Highway, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the multiple universities and airports that were built across the country. Think of our universal Medicare system and the Canada Pension Plan. All of these were made possible because of the sale of Treasury bills and bonds to the Bank of Canada. Now this went on for 36 years. And it ended in 1974 very abruptly when the government of the day, possibly under pressure from the Bank for International Settlements, abruptly abandoned selling Treasury bills to the Bank of Canada and began selling the majority of them, 90% of them, to private sector institutions. Take a look at this chart and you'll see what happened to our debt load. It exploded once that decision was made. Over the next 40 years, Canada spent more than a trillion dollars just in interest payments to private sector investors. Fast forward to the present. After a hiatus or gap of more than 45 years, Canada is once again using quantitative easing to address the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. But it's a very different form of quantitative easing from what was used in the 20th century. And the essential difference is that here, now in 2020, government will have no control over how money is spent into the economy. It's market forces that will decide that. Because the Canadian government has chosen to follow the quantitative easing model used by the United States, Great Britain, and other countries. So let me explain how that works. Back in April of this year, the Canadian government announced that the Bank of Canada would be purchasing $5 billion worth of Treasury bills every week for at least a year. But these Treasury bills would not be purchased directly from government. They would be purchased in the secondary market at auctions. 
And what the secondary market is, is a market where people, or rather institutions that already own treasury bills and bonds, can resell them to other interested financial players. So when these private sector financial players sell their bonds and bills, it's assumed that the money they get from the sale will be spent out into the economy. It's called trickle-down economics. Except it's become very clear that trickle-down economics doesn't work. There have been extensive studies showing that over the last 10 years, the principal beneficiaries of quantitative easing have been asset managers, hedge funds, wealthy property owners, and the banks themselves. So local economies have got minimum benefit from quantitative easing. Why did that happen? Well, apparently it's just a lot more lucrative for these financial players to use this money to buy and sell shares and currencies and derivatives and other financial profits. To conclude, quantitative easing is a good idea. But quantitative easing that uses secondary markets is a bad idea. And it's a bad idea because it enriches elites at the expense of local economies and the people who live and work in them. And so government should not be spending its money that way. That it is suggests, I think, that the finance sector has perhaps undue influence in the corridors of power in Ottawa. And of course, the finance sector would not want to return to the 20th century model for quantitative easing. What about our MPs? I believe that they want to serve the greater good. So I ask the question, how many MPs were even aware that there was a choice in the way that quantitative easing could be implemented? Was that choice given to them by our civil servants? Was it raised in Parliament? Was it talked about in party caucuses? Because it should have been. Transformative change often happens when there's a crisis. It was the Great Depression that pushed the government of Mackenzie King into nationalizing the Bank of Canada and then defining its role to serve the interests of the Canadian public. COVID-19 is our crisis, but it's also a, an opportunity to rethink the role of government in the economy. We had a brilliant model for quantitative easing in the 20th century, highly successful and we lost it. It's time, I think, to reclaim that vision. We need to persuade our politicians that the current 21st century model for quantitative easing is not good enough. We need a people's quantitative easing.